Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in today, for subscribing, for liking this video, for commenting on this video and all the other videos. Thank you so much. And if it's your first time, welcome to this channel. My name is Daphne and I'm very excited to see you today. Please make sure that you stay and you subscribe and you click the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on the videos on this channel. So welcome to Wisdom Wednesdays. And today we want to remember the celebration of Queen Esther and what she did for her people in pivoting their freedom, allowing the will of God to work through her. So we want to read from the book of Esther chapter 5 verse 9 to 14 and also Esther chapter 6 verse 1 to 10 which says so Haman went out that day joyful with a glad heart and when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he had that he did not stand or tremble before him he was filled with indignation against Mordecai nevertheless Haman restrained himself and went home and he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, Besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared, and tomorrow I am again invited by her, along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh, Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman so. So he had the gallows made. Chapter 6 That night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Arasaras. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servant who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king asked him, What shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, Whom would the king delight to honor? Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on his head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on the horseback through the city square, proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry! Take the robe and the horse, as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Glory to God. Glory to God. As I was just uh, reading and studying this, it's a very fascinating book. Esther, I love the book of Esther. I'm sure many of you women, especially us uh, girls and women. So... Before we go into this word, let's just uh, commit this time to the Lord. Let's just pray that he may guide and show us and reveal to us what he wants us to know for this season and what his heart is saying. Amen. Father, we bless you. We glorify you. I thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to share your truth, to share your word completely under your instruction, completely under your submission, mighty God. Have your way in the lives of your people, oh God. Help me to speak this word, oh God. Let this word, Father, be a double-edged sword to penetrate between their souls and their spirit. Father, to burn the chaff, let it be like a fire to burn the chaff in their hearts and to refine the gold that is in their hearts. Almighty God, have your way. Holy Spirit of God, speak to your people even as I speak this word. And I pray that this word may glorify you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified, for it is all about you. It is not about me. It is not about anything else, but it's all about your will. It's all about you, Lord Jesus Christ. Be glorified. Forever and ever, this we pray in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Glory to God. So here we see um, Haman uh, plotting against Mordecai. But the background of the story is that uh, the reason why Haman is doing this is because Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. Now the reason why Haman was so upset about this is revealed in Esther chapter 3 verse um, 5 to 6. It says when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on, Ham on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. So this is where the issues began. Mordecai would not pay homage to a man because he believed that this kind of level of praise, 
This level of worship is only deserving to the God who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. This kind of respect and honor is something that I can only give to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So Mordecai in his heart was not going to give this kind of worship to a man because to him it was like a form of idolatry. You see, there are levels of respect that only God deserves. Nowadays, I'm um, sorry to say this, but sometimes people worship uh, men of God and women of God. They are worshipped more than God himself. So there are levels of reverence that we should give God. Then there are levels of reverence we should give people. So Mordecai was not willing to do this. And this is where the problems began. And, you know, Haman said, you know what? Out of his anger and out of that pride in his heart, it was pride. You know what? I'm going to get his people, not just him. I'm going to get his family, not just his family. Not just his household, not just his generation. I want to destroy all his descendants, the Jewish people. So I want you to understand that Satan finds opportunities through us when we carry certain things that open the door for him. Satan is not just going to come into your life and, you know, cause problems in your life. But sometimes we open the door through things like anger, things like pride, things like unforgiveness things like bitterness. So this pride that is at work in the heart of Haman, this anger, the Bible is describing it as a wrath. This wrath in the heart of Haman is what was the door for Satan to come in and put his agenda in the heart of Haman to destroy the Jewish nation. You see, Satan was always targeting the Jewish people, targeting their deliverance. Satan had an agenda. And I guess he always thought that the seed is going to come from this people. So he was always paranoid always obnoxious, always worried and anxious, that his downfall is going to come from the Jewish people. The seed that was spoken about in the book of Genesis could come from that generation. This, this is why he was so focused on destroying the Jewish people from the days of Abel and Cain. Constantly, his agenda is to destroy the descendants or any possibility of the seed coming from a particular people or person. But what's interesting about all this when you read chapter 5 of the book of Esther is that the actual downfall of Haman did not really begin when he made the decree and when he sent out or when the letters were sent out. The Bible tells us that pride goes before a downfall. The downfall of Haman began when he, were be when he began to be prideful in his heart, when he began to exercise in his speech pride. The Bible tells us that he told his wife and his friends about all his riches, the multitude of his children, everything that the king had promoted him in and how the king had advanced him. That self-praise, the way he was talking about himself, the way he was talking about all that he has done and all that he has. It wasn't from a place of humility. You see, there's a difference between being humble and talking about what God has done for you and being prideful in a way of showing off, in a way of self-praise, in a way of self-promotion. He's saying, I have great riches. Look at the multitude of my children. I'm very fruitful. I have all these kids. The king has promoted me. It is me. And uh, he has advanced me above everybody else, above all the officials and the servants. It's about me. Look at what I have. Look at what I do. Look at everything that I have done out of my own strength. The strength of my loins. These children are the strength of my loins. Look at what I'm capable of doing. This was a display of pride. And I believe this is really where the downfall of Haman began to come. You see, when we exercise pride, there's a blindness that begins to come into our eyes. You see, when you begin to exercise pride, unfortunately, there's a, a level of blindness that begins to cover our eyes when we exercise pride. There's something about pride that brings folly and it brings blindness, not just spiritually, but also mentally. Even in your soul, pride that covers the blindness, that covers the heart, and even sometimes the logic. You lose sense of things. Pride, that's what it does. And so, out of his pride, not being able to see or to discern or to perceive, his wife and his friends say, you know what? You have all those things. Be careful about the friends that you have. You have all those things. Why don't you suggest to the king that you can kill this Mordecai? Since he's not bowing down to you. Friends that don't have any sense. Friends that catapult the pride in you. Friends that catapult the anger in you. Be careful about the kind of friends that you have. 
you're trying to work on forgiveness but the friends that you have are pushing you further and further away from the mindset of forgiveness the friends that you have pushing you further and further away from a mindset of wholeness a mindset of healing from the heartbreaks that you have a mindset of being content with the singleness that you have a mindset of being healed from the heartbreak that you had from the last relationship they keep reminding you of the pain friends that poke at the wounds so that the wounds cannot heal in the time frame that god has for you you see we need to be very careful about the people that we marry and the friends that we have these friends you see they don't have perception either they're saying why don't you suggest to kill another man because this man will not bow down to you this man is not really giving you the homage that he should be giving you, not understanding anything about worship, not understanding anything about humility, not understanding anything about self-preference. You see, just because somebody doesn't like you doesn't mean that they are a hater. Somebody not liking you doesn't mean that they are jealous of you. You see, we, are, we live in a world where there's nearly 8 billion people, and, and out of those 8 billion people, people have different preferences. People have different tastes, different passions. So because somebody doesn't like you in school or at work, it just means that they just don't like you. It's not out of jealousy. They're not jealous of you. They're not envious of you. You see, Mordecai is not jealous of Haman. Mordecai is not envious of Haman. Mordecai simply has principles of worship that, that are so exclusive to God only. He has preferences for worship that he's not willing to lower down for a man by the name of Haman. He has an understanding about reverence that no level of wealth or no level of titles and designer wear that Haman wears can change that understanding. You see, it doesn't mean that Haman, it doesn't mean that Mordecai hates Haman. No, it just means he has a different perspective and outlook concerning worship. So we need to understand this, especially in this generation. Now, because pride is at work in the life of Haman, and anything that has pride, it has to come down here on earth. Anyone who has pride, and this is not a principle based on you being a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian for you to be brought down out of pride. This is a principle on the earth. Whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, whether you are an atheist, whether you are a Buddhist, no matter who you are, where you are, there's a principle and there's a rule that has been set here on earth that pride comes before a downfall. It doesn't say pride comes before a downfall for a Christian. It just says pride comes before a downfall. This is a principle on earth. So Haman is under that principle here on earth. And so pride is at work in the heart of Haman. Pride is at work in the mindset of Haman. Pride is at work in the speech of Haman. And because pride is at work, God has begun to honor the principle that he set here on earth, that he will lift up the humble, but the prideful he pulls down. And so that same day, that same day, that same night, the Bible tells us that the king could not sleep. I believe that the doors that are set for you in this season, I believe that the people that are meant to come in contact with you in this season, those things will not rest because of your enemy that wants to see your downfall. Because of your enemy who wants to see your downfall. Your enemy is the devil. The enemy is not a person. The enemy in this uh, realm, in this covenant, is not people. The Bible tells us that we fight not against flesh and blood. So it's not like the old covenant where it's a shadow of this new covenant. The enemy is actually Satan. The enemy is the kingdom of Satan. So your enemy wants to see your downfall. And, some, and you work that agenda through people. But we must pray for those people that they are delivered, that God sets them free and that God helps them. So the enemy who wants to see your downfall in this season, but I believe that God is raising up people. He's opening doors. He's giving you power and authority to move those mountains. He's giving you strategies and understanding to pull down the Goliaths of your life. God is at work. The king could not sleep. And he ordered the book of the commandments to be brought in. There are people who will not be able to sleep in this season of your life. There are opportunities that will not be able to rest in this season. Breakthroughs and breakthroughs and opportunities are not just financial. We have to understand that as Christians. Sometimes there could be a breakthrough in your marriage. A breakthrough in your career. A breakthrough in your family. 
a breakthrough concerning people being saved in your family, a breakthrough in ministry, a breakthrough in ideas. God is too big to just be focused on just one little area like finances or one little area like marriages. But there are breakthroughs that God is at work and he's doing in this season because the enemy thinks that he's going to win, but he will not win in your life. The Bible tells us that the king could not sleep. And he began to read this book. This is all the leading of the Holy Ghost. This is all the leading of God. Because something has alerted things in the spiritual realm. There's a doorbell. There's a ringing. There's a clacking. There's an opening that has happened in the spiritual realm because somebody decided to be prideful for no reason. Somebody decided to act on their wrath whilst you have not done anything wrong. Somebody decided to be bitter and angry with you whilst you've done nothing wrong. In fact, you've only been doing good things even now. The Bible tells us that the king discovered something, that Mordecai had done something. The king discovered that Mordecai had done some good works. I believe that the things that we have been doing in secret, that whilst they are accusing you, God will remember what you have done for his kingdom. God will remember what you have done for your relatives. God will remember what you have done in your marriage. God will remember what you have done for your children. God will remember what you have done in your education, the sacrifices that you gave. I believe it's a time of remembrance. A time of remembrance in this season. God is remembering the things that his people has done. God is even remembering things that even those that who are not Christians, but the things that they have done, there's a reward for them in this season. While there's plotting, while there's avenging, while they're setting a trap for you, God is remembering what you have done. You see, Haman listened to his friends because the friends, they spoke to the pride inside of him. They spoke like Jezebel to Ahab to the selfishness inside of them. They spoke to the wrath and the bitterness inside of him. But God says, not on my watch, not in the season of remembrance, for I am remembering my people and what they have done for me. I am the God that sees all. He's the God that sees everything. And he sees everything that they are doing. There's some things that you don't even know that the enemy is plotting. But God is bringing it to nothing. He's silencing the enemy in this season. So they begin to read and the king He's so bothered about this. His heart is being stirred by the power of the Holy Ghost. His heart is being stirred by the holy angels even in that room. They are stirring his heart to find no peace, to not sleep in that night, to not find rest until promotion, until honor, until recognition is given to Mordecai for what he has done. You see, they didn't remember before, but this is an opportunity for Mordecai to be raised up at a time where the plots and the threats of Satan are so high, when the voice of fear is so high, when the voice of worry and doubt is so big, this is the time that God begins to stir the king for your life. The person who has the baton for the next season of your life, God begins to stir those people in the night, in the quiet time of the night when things are dark, when things are silent, when things look like they're not going anywhere, when people are at sleep, when there's no movement, the king's heart is being stirred because God is able to do that. Whether you're based in the USA, God is able to do that to a person who is in China, a person who is in South Africa. Right now, you're based in the United Kingdom, you're watching this video. God is able to stir the hearts of the people for your next season of your life. So the king is so bothered at night. He's probably sweating. He's probably hotter than usual at that time. And he's reading this book. He goes to the right page at the right time, at the right hour. and begins to discover about Mordecai. Because an opportunity has rang in the spiritual realm because of somebody else's pride. And this opportunity has a name. It has the name of Mordecai. And so he says, what has been done for this man? He saved my life. I see that you have saved the lives of your next generation in your family. Because of how you have preserved yourself. God is watching. You have preserved your body through the way that you live as a single person. And God sees that. And he's rewarding people with certain things. And this doesn't work for everybody. We don't become a Proverbs 31 woman because you want to be rewarded with marriage. It doesn't quite work like that. But sometimes God rewards people with marriage. Sometimes. Not every time. Sometimes it just means it's just the time frame of God. But there are rewards. I'm speaking of rewards. Rewards. God sees how you have honored yourself. How you have honored your body and how you carry yourself. Because you had a lot of opportunities to not to dishonor your body. 
you had a lot of opportunities to give away your body in a time where fornication is welcomed in a time where they laugh at you when you say that you're a virgin they begin to laugh and they call you a fool in a time when you say you're waiting till marriage they think that you're crazy this is the generation that we live in when you say i'm waiting to kiss until marriage they make youtube videos and they laugh and they say that's just crazy this generation you need to taste this you need to try this how can you get there's something wrong with you we live in a generation where holiness is laughed at a generation where the principles of marriage, the principles of singlehood, are looked at as alien. But God sees what you're going through. God sees what you're doing. I don't know who I'm speaking about, but I want to encourage you that God sees it and there's a reward for you. There's a reward for you. The Lord says, hold on. Hold on. Don't give in to the pressure. Don't give in to the pressure. Don't listen to people, what they're saying. Despite the statistics around you, don't look at that but keep your eyes on me says the lord keep your eyes on my ways says the lord there's a reward that is coming your way and god is going to bless you god is going to bless you even in your marriage god is going to begin to bless you and some of the issues that other people have you will not have those issues because for you it's a reward so god is wanting to reward mordecai for the things that he has done there are rewards that are coming even for people who have respected. There's a respect that you gave people in work, in the workplace. They were overworking you, but you just were respectful and you were, you, and you were humble. There are things that God is going to begin to do in your life. Even he'll begin to give you ideas to even start your own thing. Under a similar kind of background, a similar kind of background from where you worked right now, God is going to begin to give you supernatural ideas in this season because this is the God that we worship. He's rewarding you in this season. Hallelujah. God is rewarding you in this season. It's a season of rewards. And I hear that those that have not compromised, I'm rewarding those that have not compromised. Those that have not compromised. There's different kinds of ways of compromising in life. And you're watching this video, you're saying, uh, Daphne, you've not actually said what I did. But the Lord is saying, I see you and you have not compromised in that situation. And so he's rewarding you. He's rewarding you despite what is happening around you. The fact that you did not compromise, there's a reward coming your way. And so the king says, you know what, let me get an audience for this because I'm not understanding how there's been no honor because his heart has been stirred. And so he begins to call people around him, servants, servants with the same mindset to honor and reward those that are worthy of the honor and the reward in that season. Those that have not compromised, those whose rewards will not go unnoticed in that particular season. And the servants say, hey, we know Mordecai. In fact, yes, nothing has been done for him. No honor, no dignity has been given to him. And so in the morning, I believe this was now in the morning when the king was speaking to the servants, and that same time, Haman is in the court. Haman is there and he's about to suggest to the king to kill Mordecai. Can you believe that? The man whom God is desiring to honor, the man whom God is desiring to reward through the king, this is the same person that the enemy is suggesting to kill. You see, sometimes the enemy is going to accuse you. The enemy is the accuser of brethren. So there are certain times when we are praying prayers and the enemy comes and he's accusing. But, but because we have a great mediator whose name is Jesus Christ, he cannot accuse you anymore because you are covered. You see, you are in Christ. So when God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. You are in him. You are the body of Christ and you are in him. So you are covered. He can no longer accuse you anymore. The price was paid. The enemy will try to accuse you in your mind and you'll say you're a failure. You didn't do this right today, so you've already failed. Don't listen to those empty threats. Understand who you are. Understand what Jesus has done for you. It's very important to have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done so that you will not give in to the empty threats of Satan. He has no teeth, a lion with no teeth walking around, making empty threats. But when you know who you are, you can speak back and say, Jesus Christ is my mediator. I am in Christ. I'm hidden in him. And he has set, free, set me free from bondage. In, in fact, he made you and your powers a public spectacle on the cross. The cross triumphed over you. You have no more power in this situation. I am the head of this situation, above and not beneath. Haman coming to the king who is about to promote, who is about to give a reward and honor to Mordecai. They will not stop your rewards in this season. 
They will not stop your honor in this season. Despite the empty threats, despite what they say, despite what they do, no matter how many gallows they put, no matter what they say about you, they cannot stop the reward of the Lord. And so the king says, bring him in if he's in the court. And the king says, what shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? I believe that God delights in honoring you in this season. I believe that the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is delighting in honoring his people. God delights in honoring his people in this season and in every season. God is delighting in honoring his people in this season. I'm not saying God is King Ahasuerus. I'm just saying God is delighting in honoring his people in this season. And Haman, out of the pride and the insolence and the arrogance in his heart, he says, who, who else? Who else would the king delight to honor more than me? Who else would the king delight to honor? Who else can find delight and honor in the sight of the king besides me? And so he thinks this is all about him. Remember pride. Pride is what is going to bring the people who are working against you down in this season. You see, you don't even need to do anything. You don't need to shout with anybody or argue with anybody. But the pride at work in them is what is going to bring them down. You don't need to make any warfare prayers. Mordecai did not make any warfare prayers. You see, pride is enough to bring people down. And Haman begins to suggest all these wonderful and marvelous things. Put on him designer wear. Put on him these royal robes that the king has worn. Put on him jewelry and, and Louis Vuitton and uh, Chanel. Put on, put on him all these wonderful things and rubies and diamonds. And let a horse be delivered to him. Let, let a Bentley be delivered to him. Let, let a Rolls Royce be given to him so he can ride around in the, ro in the Rolls Royce throughout the town. I'm just paraphrasing <laughs> the modern day generation. And perhaps at the most beautiful locations, maybe in Paris, maybe in New York or London, or in uh, Cape Town, let him parade around the city square. The city square probably in those days was the place where a lot of people would hang out, possibly those who are noble, those who can afford to be there. The epicenter of the city where there's all these nice attractions and stuff. This is why I'm saying New York and Paris. And proclaim before him, thus it shall be done for the, to the man whom the king delights to honor. And the king said, hurry Haman, do that for Mordecai. Can you believe, can you imagine how Haman felt when he had to parade, parade the man that he wants to kill? The man that he hates, the man that he has wrath against, the man that he wants to pull down and has brought down the gallows for. I believe that the plots and the plans that Satan has against you in this season, those plots and plans are actually going to work out for your good. We see that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, it looked like things are working against him because he died on the cross. But not knowing that there's another part of the story, he rose again after three days. You see, our justification didn't begin when he died on the cross. When he died on the cross, that, that was where the redemption started. That was, that was more for the redemption. But our justification began when he rose again. So there's two parts of the story. There's a redemption and there's a justification. So Satan did not know that there's two sides to the story. So sometimes Satan might not know that there's two sides to the story. You see, he may send the attacks. He may send all these plots against you. But there's another side of the story where things are working out together for your good. Today we want to pray. The Lord is saying your good rewards will not go unnoticed in this season. And he's also saying that it's a season of rewards for his people. And again, I want, you, I want to emphasize that rewards are not necessarily attached to physical things. It can be mental breakthroughs, spiritual breakthroughs that can change and shift your generation and your household, even your city. Shifting climates and cultures. There's a shift that God can do through these rewards in this season because God is remembering his people. As we remember Esther and what she did for her people, I believe that God is also remembering his church remembering what they have been doing for him, remembering the things that they've been doing for his kingdom, remembering the sacrifices that they've been making. I believe even sacrifices that your parents or your grandparents have done that have still not been remembered, that have still not been rewarded for. I believe God is even making rewards for things that have been done in previous generation, in your generation, through you. So today we want to pray and we just want to thank God. We're not going to ask anything. We want to thank Him for these rewards. We want to thank Him for remembering us in this season. We want to thank Him for these delights that are coming our way, these honors that are coming our way. 
these dignities that are being bestowed upon the church coming our way. I want to thank him. Do you want to thank him with me? Let us thank him together. Oh God, honor, honor and glory and honor and glory belongs to you. Oh, great I am. Blessed be your name, most high God. You are worthy of the adoration, worthy of the honor and the praise. And we want to thank you today. Oh God, as you remember the church, as you remember your people and you are at work behind the scenes. Father, even though we cannot see it, you are at work and you are rewarding your people. Thank you for rewarding us in this season with dignity. Thank you for rewarding your people with dignity. Re rewarding your people with honor. Oh God, how great is your honor. How great are your rewards, Father of lights, in whom there is no darkness, shadow or shifting. Your rewards are great. God, we thank you for your rewards. Thank you for your people whom you find delight in. I thank you that the enemy cannot accuse these anymore, Father. For the cost was paid. The price was paid through Jesus Christ. And you have justified your people. Oh, Lord, as you redeemed the Jewish, as you redeemed Israel, you justified the church. And I thank you. We thank you, Father, for your justification. Even now, you are justifying your people through different ways, Lord through different seasons. Oh God, we bless you. We honor you. We thank you, Father. We are so encouraged on how you dignified and how you gave honor to Mordecai, your servant, oh God. He didn't need to pray any prayer warfares. He didn't need to beg, oh God, but you are at work behind the scenes because an opportunity came in through the pride of Haman. Oh God, your word says pride comes before a downfall. Lord, that was an opportunity, oh God, to lift, oh God, Mordecai up even through his humility to not fight with Haman, his humility to be quiet, his humility to not complain, his humility to not protest to Haman, oh God, but in his quietness and in his humility and silence, you lifted Mordecai up at the right time, at the right place, oh God, we thank you. I thank you that for your people. You are lifting them up at the right time and at the right place. Father, be glorified, be magnified, Lord, I thank you that you're putting the enemy to shame, for he does not know everything. You know everything. Satan is not mindful of your plans. And, oh God, we thank you that he is blind, but you are the God who sees. You see, oh God, and you see everything. And so we give you the glory. We give you the honor. You are the all-powerful God, all-knowing God, all-seeing God. You are the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that is inside of them. You have established them. You are the establisher even of our faith. Oh God, what an honor and a privilege to worship you and to praise you. Oh God, what an honor and a privilege to be called your children. Father, we bless you. And we are so honored to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. Lord, be glorified forever and ever. In this time and season of your great rewards, as your people rest their confidence and their minds and hearts in you, oh God, have your way forever and ever. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Amen and amen. And so God bless you. And please remember to testify what God is doing in your life. So that we can encourage each other in the comment section. When people come, they'll be encouraged to see that surely God is at work. God bless you and I will see you very soon. Take care of yourself. Bye.